I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Today, David, we're going to continue our series on the military, on war. Uh, (laughs) Ooh, I see we've upgraded our soundboard. Thanks to all our uh, our Patreon donations, they're really they're really paying off. (laughs) That's the greatest grift ever. Just take the Patreon donations, tell everybody we we bought an awesome soundboard, but really we're just using our. (laughs) Anyway, send us some more money. But <laughs> we're talking about uh, the military once again, David. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the externalities, the environmental externalities of the military. We're going to be talking with Dr. Patrick Bigger, who is at Lancaster University and was one of the authors of a new paper titled The Hidden Carbon Costs of the Everywhere War. And you might have heard this paper in the news. You've probably seen this stat repeated in all sorts of media sites on the past couple of weeks that the U.S. military pollutes more in terms of carbon emissions and greenhouse gases than the country of Portugal. Well, that's this paper and this professor, Dr. Patrick Bigger and his colleagues. And we're very excited to talk about him later on. It's a great paper. You can find a link to it on the website if you want to read it before we start the interview. AshesAshes.org. But before we get into the interview, David, I want to hone in on the phrase, the everywhere war, which is in the title of that paper, because we didn't talk about the everywhere war in our interview with Patrick, but I think it's an an important concept and framework when we start thinking about U.S. military operations around the world. It's a phrase that was coined in 2011 by Derek Gregory in his paper published in the Geographical Journal, appropriately titled The Everywhere War. And what he outlines is ways in which following 9-11, The United States transformed the way it conducted war in such a way that has led to the militarization of the entire planet, really. And this transformation was seen most acutely in the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, which was an elevation of the U.S. military into a permanent state of war. And permanent war suits the modus operandi of U.S. national security policy, which for the past several decades has, quote, required the U.S. to maintain a global military presence, configure its armed forces for power projection, and employ them to impose changes abroad, end quote. And this escalation has not just been towards a permanent state of war, but war that is occurring everywhere. That is, the everywhere war. The everywhere war expands as the well-defined contours of war are replaced by these nebulous gray zones and wild zones in which there's really no discernible difference between the wars of advanced militaries like that of the U.S. or the U.K., Russia, China, and sectarian wars that are fought locally, especially in the global south and especially, especially in the Middle East, where the lines between non-combatant and combatant are often non-existent. In Afghanistan and Iraq, even the lines between forces are blurred as the U.S. military has augmented its own forces with things like paid warlords, local militias, and even the Taliban itself at various moments in these conflicts. But these shifts in warfare should be understood as distinctly American in conception. After all, the U.S. is the one which has led the charge on intentionally diluting the concept of a battlefield in favor of nebulous transnational territories of war in which any individual can be put on a CIA hit list and responsibility for all collateral damage, including innocent lives lost in the pursuit of those individuals, can be offloaded and ignored. And even further, the U.S. has intentionally blurred these lines between what is military and what is not. So, I mean, we have our own official soldiers. These are the guys who have army patches or marine patches, whatever, and they serve the Department of Defense. Uh, They get a government paycheck. But we also have huge amounts of private contractors, of mercenary groups. And then also we've handed over some control, advanced military weapons, and even military missions to traditionally civilian organizations like the CIA. And and 
the result of all this is this very strange mishmash of what is military, what isn't. It's confusing. And that also bleeds over into what we consider combatants. Uh, what are good guys, what are bad guys, uh, who counts as combatant, what doesn't, and the uh, entire lines of what war is, which is something that's supposed to be sharp, it's a guy in uniform shooting another guy in uniform, is now uh, very confusing and murky. And finally, it, it has been the U.S.'s declaration of a global war on terror that has itself defined the whole world as an ongoing battle space. And so this everywhere war now let loose upon the world is advantageous to oppressive and authoritarian governments everywhere who can use the ill-defined war on terror or war on drugs to criminalize civilians and others who challenge state authority. Quote, certainly Mexico was no stranger to military repression. During the dirty war from the 1960s through to the 1980s, the army was given carte blanche to put down student demonstrations and guerrilla groups and it carried out disappearances and illegal detentions, torture and killing on such a scale that the United States noted an emerging security problem. The cloak for these bloody operations was the Cold War, and some scholars believe that the drug war now serves as a convenient cover for the renewed criminalization of social protest. And to bring this concept to the here and now and the immediate problems that the United States finds itself facing, we can look at the U.S.'s criminalization of migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border, many of whom are direct victims of this war on drugs and these other governmental policies that the United States have either put into practice directly or pressured other countries to do so on their behalf. And as we've seen, as the U.S. has blurred the lines at the border between civilian and military, we've started augmenting our own border control with military forces. And this turns the border itself into a kind of a war zone, and that plays out in things like drones, machine guns, and, and ultimately up to the point where we actually have physical military detachments guarding against, well, what was that, the, the migrant caravans uh, that the news was so panicked about, firing tear gas at children, right. uh, these people who are, are full-time soldiers. And this has precedent in the lead-up to the Everywhere War. Historically, the United States has been steadily increasing the militarization of the border. From the paper, quote, a cascading series of joint operations from Operation Blockade in El Paso in 1993 through Gatekeeper in San Diego and Safeguard in Arizona to Rio Grande in Texas in 1997 was designed to capture undocumented migrants who were held to be responsible for increased criminal activity in border cities and to deflect countless others into remote desert areas where they were knowingly exposed to death. In what has been indicted as an endless deferral of human responsibility, their deaths were misattributed to natural causes. The risk of dying on the crossing has steadily increased. 9-11 prompted and permitted the formation of a still more intensive military security nexus that rendered undocumented migrants even more vulnerable to an emergent necropolitics by imaginatively placing them in a war zone where they become, in effect, unlawful combatants. Many of the military units involved in border support now saw the mission as a pre-deployment exercise for combat in Afghanistan and Iraq, and this imaginative remapping was reinforced by a cascading series of institutional, technical, and cultural developments. Then, in May 2006, even as Bush peddled the fiction that the United States is not going to militarize the southern border, he announced the deployment of 6,000 National Guard troops to the border and what he hailed as the most technologically advanced border security initiative in American history. These measures hastened the rhetorical collapse of the alien into the terrorist and, as Rosas observed, allowed the violent subjugation of immigrants to the special relation of illegality. End quote. And David, the U.S.-Mexico border is just one example of many where we have been conditioned to perceive it as an area inherently violent and thus in need of a military presence. But this conditioning or perception shift is slowly being superimposed over every corner of the globe. And this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or feedback loop, if you will, because military garrison outside domestic territory and the criminalization of brown people's existence that goes alongside that 
is itself so often the cause of violence in the first place, reinforcing this notion that a strong military presence is necessary. And today, the scale of U.S. military operations around the world has only increased, and dramatically so. Between 2015 and 2017, the U.S. military was directly active in 76 countries, including seven which have been on the receiving end of drone and missile strikes. But David, we're not here to discuss foreign policy necessarily. Why are we talking about the everywhere war? <laughs> you had me fooled. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to set the stage because a war that is everywhere and forever ongoing necessarily requires the burning of a never-ending furnace, right? The war machine does not just keep on rolling without a steady supply of hydrocarbon fuel and its uh, attendant emissions. <laughs> that, that sounds like a very carefully prepped PR phrase. Hydrocarbon fuel and its attendant emissions. Uh, man, tanks burn a lot of gas. So do jets. All this stuff burns a lot of gas. Let's, let's make this simple here. Uh, war's expensive. You know, like here in the United States, we talk about the military and everything all the time. Tanks go boom, boom. In terms of, uh, well, it's so much money. What is it? $700 billion over that every year annually that we spend on it. And then the discussion ends like, oh, okay, that's how much it costs. But If we have learned anything from this show, Daniel, it's that things never end in just the basic quantification number of dollars. That's true. There's always unforeseen costs, and war is certainly no different. And in fact, as we'll talk about in this paper and as we go through the rest of this episode, uh, those costs are incredibly high. We've talked previously on this show in episode 43, FUBAR, about some of the environmental damage directly that the military wages both uh, domestic places where we've poisoned water supplies, poisoned the land, whatever, but also in these pristine natural islands you want to bomb the shit of out in the, <laughs> the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Uh, it's a great episode with an interview with a great activist. If you're not familiar with this, definitely check it out. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of these unforeseen, unaccounted externalities that we are charging up to our bill with these ultimate climate reckoning and, and a lot of other unfortunate reckonings. I mean, air pollution is the number one killer in the world right now. And a lot of this fuel is extremely dirty, especially the stuff the Navy burns. A lot of the fuel that we burn in our jets is dirty. Um, this high performance aircraft burns fuel much less efficiently than other aircraft and it burns it at high altitude, which drips down. I mean, the every single part of this is problematic. Uh, these secondary pollutants are, are very problematic. The greenhouse gases are problematic. The United States military is one of the the most major greenhouse polluters in the world. In fact, as an organization, it, it certainly is the single greatest. They are the single greatest purchaser of fuels as a single organization in the world. They and and there's a lot of other things even beyond these externalities that that the paper and that later in the on in this interview that we discuss the amount of concrete that they use for the construction of of their bases, their runways, their roads, the amount of food necessary to feed and upkeep this massive military push, the land use that goes to all these bases, the huge amounts of weapon testing range, not just in the United States, but all around the world, the environmental costs of this endless war that we've created are enormous. And we never see them beyond this, this byline in the media saying $700 billion to the military this year. And that's where the conversation ends. And it ignores these huge costs that ultimately probably have a greater effect on each and every one of us than this money that comes out of a budget that we create the money anyway. And I don't want to get into modern monetary theory. I don't know if we'll ever do that on the show, that it is something we've talked about doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm of mixed emotions on some of it. But you know, whatever. Money's made up. We're we're printing the money. We're spending it. Whatever. It, It doesn't matter. But these environmental costs do have very real costs. They have absolutely real impacts. And of course, this is ignoring the the very real impacts of the actions the military takes, where that means, as they've they've nicely summed up as collateral damage, but but you know, is the loss of lives of oftentimes innocent people, or if it's not the direct loss of lives, it's it's uh displacement, it's uh injuries, it's uh pollution of of areas where they've, they've people have lived for years and now they can't go back. Uh, all these costs have a human toll. And then also on the soldiers themselves, the both the physical health impacts of, of waging war, of carrying too much gear, of destroying their knees if, if they make it out at, at most ideally, to you know very severe traumatic mental illnesses, 
and, and then more serious injuries at that. And for what? Like, what are, what are we doing all this violence? What are we running up this enormous bill for? And ultimately, of course, it's to support the, uh, the financial interests of the United States, of the people in control of these, of uh, other countries. And so, of course, it, when you look at it from that perspective, that these sacrifices may make sense. But for everyone else on Earth who is indirectly profiting from this, and, and to be fair, you know, Daniel, you and I as Americans are profiting off of it, but not nearly as much as, you know, say the, the CEO of Raytheon or whatever. But Well, and also considering that that profit is short term, right? Like mm-hmm. we might enjoy materially better lives today because of U.S. imperialism, but those materially better lives don't necessarily outweigh the lost uh, social connections, the loss of community, and of course, the loss of the environment, which we will depend on if we want to continue these lives of ours, right? <laughs> yeah, I sort of need a, a like healthy earth to live. But uh, as the military very famously said in one town hall, I think in Virginia, uh, we are in the business of war, not in the business of defending the environment. So uh, I think that leaves... <laughs> Makes very clear their thoughts on that. And uh, before I get too much into this, this uh, there is no profit rant that I love so much, uh, maybe we should turn to the interview and let a real expert teach us a little bit about the military and its greenhouse emissions and the logistics of this endless war. We're happy to be joined now by Dr. Patrick Bigger of Lancaster University. Patrick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, y'all. So tell us a little bit about the recent paper that came out. Yeah, so with a couple of uh, co-authors, uh, Dr. Oliver Belcher at Durham University, Dr. Ben Nymark, where I'm at at Lancaster at the Environment Center, and uh, Kara Kinley, who uh, was kind of our technical assistant on this paper doing the hard work of number crunching, we tried to figure out exactly how much fuel the U.S. military is burning on an annual basis. Uh, and it turns out that it's quite a bit. But the question wasn't just how much fuel, that's kind of a, an accounting uh, exercise. We also wanted to figure out how it's even possible for the U.S. military to procure, distribute, and then burn as much fuel as entire countries, like a lot of Scandinavian countries or Portugal. You mentioned trying to find out how much fuel the military was using. Why did you have to find it out? So there's a long-running conflict uh, basically between the military and other parts of the government and with international agreements about whether or not to report the military's greenhouse gas emissions. And this was such a big deal that the U.S. threatened to walk away from the Kyoto Protocol negotiations if there wasn't an explicit exemption granted for military reporting, uh, which the Europeans eventually caved to, along with a number of other things, including uh, starting a cap-and-trade market. But then, you know, and then the U.S. walked away anyway, but they still kept that exemption. And so the U.S. military uh, has not been systematically reporting its greenhouse gas emissions ever. And so there's some data that you can find here and there. There's there's reasonably good data from the Department of Energy that's been used by other researchers to, to come to similar conclusions as us. But instead, we just went straight to the source. We went to this really obscure little sub-agency called the Defense Logistics Agency and put in a series of Freedom of Information Act requests to get data on every gallon of fuel that they bought between 2013 and 2017. The Defense Logistics Agency and specifically the sub uh, office of energy. So this is kind of a sub sub agency, right? So they're within the Department of Defense and then uh, the Defense Logistics Agency Energy is a, is a sub-office that deals with all things fuel and energy related. And this is a pretty wild uh, institution that nobody that I know of has really looked at uh, because the Defense Logistics Agency effectively serves as the military's internal market for everything that it gets, right? So it's the one that kind of goes outward facing and offers uh, you know, requests for for bids and bids out a bunch of stuff, and then it buys it, and then it sells it on to the different branches within uh, within the military. Uh, so it's kind of the pivot point for the entire U.S. war machine. Yeah, you describe it in the paper as a bureaucracy that hides in plain sight, but it also wasn't always around, right? So how did the military procure fuel before the Defense Logistics Agency? So it's got a long history. Yeah, you know, I think the 
the military first starts using fossil fuels in, in its coal-fired boat, the Demologos, in the you know early 19th century. And starting at that point, each branch of the military just was kind of going out and buying their own stuff and had their own quartermasters who uh, kind of went out and bought what, whatever they needed. But after World War II, it became clear that that was an incredibly unwieldy system. And so one of the first things that uh, Robert McNamara did as Secretary of Defense in the run up to and kind of during Vietnam was to consolidate the purchasing uh, practices of the different branches. Uh, and the very first one that they went after was energy, kind of il- really illustrating the centrality of procuring and distributing fuel for uh, waging modern warfare. You know, so we, we found these really great stats that were done by a, an analyst uh, who kind of does this stuff, stuff for fun out of France, showing that uh, per soldier per day fuel consumption has gone up more than 20 times between World War II and today. Yeah, this was one of my favorite points in the paper, and it really illustrates just how much this fuel use has increased. Uh, so during the Second World War, uh, soldiers on average were using just one gallon of fuel per day. By the end of Vietnam, that was up to nine gallons of fuel per day. And a lot of this was because of the explosion that jets required in terms of their fuel consumption. And then a modern soldier is now using something over 22 gallons of fuel per day. That's like an entire tank of gas from an American car, at least, in a single day's worth of work. And, and that, that's incredible. And I think one of the things that's really important, and you know, maybe we'll come back to this, is that a lot of that fuel is burned in the U.S. military's various overseas adventures, but the majority of it's actually actually burned domestically, right? So it's not just that we're burning all this fuel going out and doing you know air raids in uh, you know East Africa or setting up forward operating bases all over Afghanistan. Most of this fuel is getting burnt in the U.S. and on various U.S. military installations all over the world. Uh, So the U.S. military, even if we weren't conducting all of our sundry interventions, would still have a massive fuel consumption footprint. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, but it does make me wonder how much of the domestic fuel consumption is in some way indirectly supporting foreign operations. You know, for every drone that's being operated overseas, there's got to be a headquarters in the United States to support that, right? Yeah, for sure. And uh, that's hopefully something we're going to tease out in future research. But uh, right now, I don't think we've got data at that level of granularity to to really say one way or the other. And, and this data is also fuel use specifically purchased by the military. So it doesn't include all the fu- fuel use, say, to build a jet or to build a bomb or something before it enters the, the military itself, the Department of Defense. Yeah, which is wild if you start thinking about those kind of the the, you know, the, the chains of carbon that link uh, all of the different raw material going into the stuff that the military actually uses. Uh, and it also doesn't include all the other kind of, you know, Department of Homeland Security operations. Uh, so, like, this doesn't include the fuel used by the CIA's drone missions, mm. uh, you know, and God knows how many, you know, missions they're flying on a daily basis so we've we've, our our count is definitely partial and so this should be taken as an extremely conservative estimate yeah i have a question about that so patrick you write that the u.s military is the 47th largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world but that's only taking into account the emissions from direct fuel consumption and and purchase when you're saying it's the 47th largest does that mean that the other institutions on that list are also restricted in in the data only on their fuel consumption? Or is the U.S. military the 47th largest? And that doesn't include all the other ways that they're emitting greenhouse gases, but the data for everybody else is kind of encompassing their total greenhouse gas emissions, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. So it's the latter. Uh, So if we're only taking into consideration the liquid fuels Uh, and, you know, a little bit of coal that the U.S. military burns, it would be the 47th largest uh, national emitter. uh, And that's taking into account every other country's total greenhouse gas emissions. And so we start taking into account uh, all the other stuff that goes in 
one of my favorite things to think about that we're, we're, we're trying to get some grant money to follow up on is thinking about the amount of concrete uh, the U.S. has poured in the last uh, you know, 17 years. Because concrete, uh, you know, manufacturing concrete has a massive carbon footprint that isn't accounted for in the data that we that we have so far. They basically turned Baghdad into a, a, a maze of concrete walls. If you don't mind, Patrick, I want to just come back real quick to the Defense Logistics Agency, because you mentioned that this was a direct response to the kind of clunky nature of, you know, following World War II, every military branch just trying to procure their own fuel and kind of being inefficient. But you also write about how this was a response to a changing warfighting strategy by the American military. Can you talk a little bit about how warfighting itself has changed, requiring the ability to consolidate fuel procurement in basically anywhere in the world? Yeah, well, and I think that what we're seeing and what we've seen since since Vietnam is the increasing kind of technologization of war, where we've got more and more high tech kit that is more and more energy hungry. Uh, but especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, we've seen America emerge as the you know the sole superpower that very much sees kind of a post territorial world where. U.S. military can and will intervene anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. And in order to do so, they need access to fuel anywhere in the world. And so, you know, this this appears more, you know, in, in more plain sight following Vietnam for sure. But if we discuss in, uh, in this paper and in another paper that I've written with one of my co-authors here, this goes back to Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century and the transition from coal to diesel powered ships for the US Navy, where the US really starts building a global logistical uh, system for refueling ships with diesel. And they called it the Great White Fleet, right? Because the smoke that was coming out of the smokestacks was black when it was burning coal, but it moved to uh, white exhaust coming out of the, the diesel fired engines. And so this really starts to build the global network of fuel acquisition that the U.S. kind of continues to build over the course of the 20th century and now uh, appears as a system of, you know, some massive number, 5,000 different refueling stations located literally all over the world and, and you know, in every allied or at least friendly country. And so it's it's really kind of a, an amazing triumph of logistics to be able to source, distribute, and then burn. Just you know, I think the number we came up with was one hundred or two hundred and seventy thousand barrels of refined product a day, which is the size of you know, just about the biggest refinery in the state of California has that kind of throughput. That's incredible. We need to lay the numbers out like that. And uh, I mean, I, I love logistics talk. Uh, I know we talk about it a lot on this this show, but really it's, logistics is is the thing that birthed our civilization as we know it now. Um, and it really is inextricably linked to military logistics. One figures something out, it passes it to civilization, which passes it back to military and it's back and forth. And, and I mean, throughout military history, it's always been a conversation of like, yeah, you know, you, you have battle strategy, but really when it comes down to it, wars are won by logistics. And uh, I, I guess this is the agency that focuses on this stuff um, and, and just the sheer enormous size of the U.S. logistic machine is what gives them such incredible reach around the world that enables them to push their needs and desires. And uh, at the same time, it seems sort of like... Uh, feedback loop where you have this massive logistic power and you're out everywhere, but that increases your needs for access to these fuels, increases your need to maintain these logistics, and then you're caught in this trap where you can never get out of it. You have to keep maintaining it, and then you always need more to do that. And I, I think it's interesting that this exploding amount of fuel use, which you know part of it is technology-driven, but part of it is also reach-driven, really goes to show the consequences of that kind of catch-22. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, so if we think about uh, how U.S. You know, political military hegemony is projected around the world and has been for the last 
whatever it is, 30 years now, you know, there's two key features, I think, and that is the use of the dollar as the reserve currency and overwhelming military superiority through the, you know, of the U.S. military. And both of those things are predicated on oil, right? About global oil markets being denominated in dollars and the U.S. military effectively having unlimited access to as much oil as it wants to burn at any given time. So you can really see how the kind of the two main facets of U.S. hegemony more broadly are predicated on unlimited fuels. And, you know, we can critique that for all sorts of reasons. But one reason that we really need to be thinking about that is climate change uh, and, you know, the sheer volume of greenhouse gas emissions that the U.S. military are pumping into the atmosphere for you know whatever it ends it is that we think the u.s military are are pursuing that's not my area of expertise but it seems like (laughs) a damn lot of of emissions you know and it's it may not look like that much on on the surface you know it's like four percent of total u.s emissions but if we're serious about uh decarbonizing the u.s economy and the world as rapidly as we need to to avoid you know really unpredictable feedback loops, then this seems like a pretty reasonable place to start. Well, in one sense, you mentioned feedback loops here, and I think almost the U.S. military starts becoming a factor as a climate feedback loop, because as we see this sort of destabilization of the world because of these climate crises that occur on a warming planet, the U.S. military feels more motivated to act and and do things, thereby emitting more fuel and contributing to this problem. And so they've almost created their own loop. It's, I think it's really funny. Well, they've got their own la- language to talk about this exactly. They don't come to the same conclusions that we just have here, but I think it, it plays out really neatly. So they've, the, the way that the kind of U.S. national defense establishment prefers to talk about climate change is as a threat multiplier, right? So not that climate change is necessarily a threat unto itself, but that it'll exacerbate all sorts of known and emergent risks all over the world. And so you can see this with the way that people have talked about uh, climate change contributing to the Syrian civil war, right? But, you know, that was probably simmering anyway, but maybe climate change gave it a nudge. You know, it became a threat that the U.S. decided to respond to. And so, Climate change is going to produce more and more or, or, or make more and more conflicts worse to the point where the U.S. will decide to intervene. And that can be either in term, you know, militarily or giving humanitarian aid or whatever. Right. But in order to perform all of those operations, they have to burn massive amounts of fuel, which then you know give rise to more intense uh, climate change, which then exacerbate more conflicts. And that's what your feedback looks like when you mm-hmm. think about it in terms of a, a you know climate change being a threat multiplier. Well, do you see the military trying to adapt to climate change in terms of fuel usage? Yeah, so another paper that I've, I've written with my, my colleague, Ben Nymark, who is also on this most recent paper, was about the U.S. military's biofuels project that ran from the mid-2000s up until 2017 ish It's a really interesting program because it initially came out of an Air Force program to try to make uh, jet fuel out of coal. Uh, But that became politically unpopular because of the, uh, you know, coal liquids is amongst the most filthy fuels you can imagine, uh, not just in terms of climate change, but in terms of all sorts of other co-pollutants. And so they started looking into producing biofuels and what they called third generation biofuels which were the kind where you could take kind of anything made out of carbon, any kind of agricultural feedstock and refine it so well that it performed identically to the fossil fuel equivalent. And this was in response to a couple things. One of them was the rapidly rising uh, price of oil in the mid 2000s up and culminating in 29, 2010. Uh, where oil averaged over 100 bucks a barrel for the entire year. And so it really was starting to cut into the military's budget as massive as it was, because every dollar you spend on oil, you're obviously not spending on something else. But the other thing was how much oil was costing in other ways, especially the number of people, U.S. military personnel and contractors who were dying, just delivering fuel all over Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you know, dying in roadside bombings. And so the goal was to really start coming up with new ways of reducing oil consumption and reducing dependence on oil. 
because remember this is also before the shale revolution in the u.s and so uh there wasn't that kind of quick seemingly unlimited oil reserve back at home and so you have people like james mattis saying uh you know saying unleash us from the tether of fuel you know come up with these new technologies that will allow us to kind of continue to intervene in this post-territorial world but with less reliance on on oil and so one of the things that the military was doing was was creating this third generation biofuel but it was costing you know somewhere in the order of 50 to 80 dollars a gallon compared to you know four bucks a gallon for jet fuel and oil state republicans like james inhofe from oklahoma just absolutely flipped his shit uh and made it so that it was extremely difficult for the military to buy fuel at higher than prevailing rates and that kind of killed that program and so you know the, the way we think about it it's like it's absolutely good that the military is devoting money to developing non-fossil fuel fuels but at the same time the entire point of these fuels was that they could just be dropped into existing weapon systems right. which means that any time that the kind of political winds change course we could go back to using oil the very next day well and you also emphasize in your paper the need not just to look at the fuel source that the military is trying to use you know whether or not we're using solar panels on tanks <laughs> but what you kind of emphasize is that it's more important to look at the underlying supply chains and infrastructure that exist to even make it possible not just to procure fuel but to consume as much as we want in the first place and i guess this kind of ties into the concept of hydrocarbon fuel path dependencies can you talk a little bit about what that is yeah totally i mean so just by by path dependency all we mean is that there's kind of a, a structure put in place to accomplish any given goal and it becomes harder and harder to to break out of those path dependencies of the the structures uh, the more entrenched that they become. And the U.S. military has an incredibly well-entrenched uh, fossil fuel procurement, distribution, and consumption kind of structure in place. And so when we go out and spend, Jesus, however much on, it, you know, on an F-35, presumably the military is going to want, if it ever becomes usable, they're going to want to be able to use that weapon system as much as possible. And that might be through whatever marginal amounts of biofuels that they're buying, uh, but more likely it'll be done with conventional jet fuel because that is what the Defense Logistics Agency with its multi-billion dollar operating budget in addition to the money that it spends on fuel and its vast network of experts uh, who are you know, experts in, in mundane things, really boring bureaucratic tasks like writing contracts with local fuel distributors or operating the purchase card system so that if you're you know, some dude working at a base, you can go and fill up your truck. You know, just this absolutely sprawling bureaucratic apparatus that locks us into particular ways of procuring fuel that are not easily changed. Well, and, and I think it's really important how you emphasize that, again, it's kind of the, the policies that we pursue and the, the strategy of quote unquote war fighting that itself kind of locks these things in where like if we say, okay, we're going to commit to counterinsurgency. Okay, well, that means we're going to have to go into a possibly a rural country or set up a forward operating base. That forward operating base needs a helicopter to come in and, and provide fuel every single day. Well, that itself is burning a huge amount of fuel just because we committed to this type of counterinsurgency strategy. And it kind of blew my mind how you outlined that, in fact, the military was burning so much fuel to, de to deliver by air to these forward operating bases in Afghanistan that the U.S. Agency for International Development actually stepped in and committed to building roads in Afghanistan so that it would be cheaper to deliver fuel, which is, like, is so contradictory to me because this is an agency, um, a United States agency that purports to be you know, committed to helping develop communities all over the world basically rise out of poverty, uh, develop their infrastructure, <laughs> you know, kind of put people on the path towards peace and prosperity. But here they are literally paving the road for fuel trucks to, to deliver to our military uh, bases. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's wild how much 
infrastructure gets built in the name of producing, uh, you know, in the name of doing security. I've got a, a totally different research project on uh, World Bank funding mechanisms for infrastructure in the global south. And, you know, loads of, uh, loads of the justification that go into those loan programs to, you know, build seawalls or build, a, you know, more resilient transportation infrastructure, you know, it's about security and about resilience, right? And about creating societies that don't crumble in the face of climate change. And so this isn't a discourse or a set of practices that's unique to the kind of military USA complex. It's much broader, I think, in terms of, of development. But at the same time, one of the things that I think is really ironic about the Afghanistan case, in the case of, of Highway 1, is that you produce this road that is good for driving on. And so long after the U.S. leaves, if indeed uh, we ever do, this is going to be a road that enables the increased consumption of fossil fuels in Afghanistan, right? And so this road that was built for transporting one particular kind of fuel for one particular end will end up being part of the global hydrocarbon lock-in. Mm. Well, this goes back to that logistic talk that we had earlier, how it just the military spreads their logistics out everywhere, and then that ends up contributing to the logistics of civilization. I mean, Eisenhower went to Europe, saw the amazing Autobahn over there, brought it back to the U.S., and, and now look at what it's done to our fossil fuel use, and they're doing the same thing to Afghanistan and Iraq and everywhere else. Uh, it, all this stuff is just so completely intertwined with each other. It's... Uh, it's another feedback loop. I guess I'm stuck on feedback loops today. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's almost like there was a conscious effort to produce a world in this vision. <laughs> I'm curious, and obviously the U.S. military is the global leader here, but have you thought about exploring these types of trends in other areas, other militaries, perhaps Great Britain's military or, or even BAE systems or something like that? Yeah, we, we have... And it's something that we definitely like to get into. Since the paper came out, uh, we've had a couple different uh, NGOs reach out to us for advice on how to do similar work. Uh, and a group based out of London is looking at doing the same for uh, NATO as a whole or NATO excluding the U.S. So they're trying to figure out how to get a hold of that data. Uh, and that might be easier now that the Kyoto Protocol has done away with the military emissions exemption. Uh, but getting any kind of historical data might be a bigger challenge. And then one of the things that I'm assigning my students more recently, and I've got these undergraduate dissertation students, uh, and I'm having them go out and look at individual sets of military exercises and trying to calculate the carbon emissions from, you know, the, you know, Arctic war games or something like that, the, you know, the Pacific war games, and just figure out how much it costs to do these readiness exercises that are potentially made redundant or irrelevant by changing environmental conditions. Well, Patrick, I wanted to ask you, what do we what do we do about all this? Given that the US military is such an, you know, the largest institution in the world for greenhouse gas emissions, and that's not even including anything outside of direct fuel consumption, how should we think about the US military going forward? What, what should our response be as a public? I think the the kind of slogan that we've landed on is that the the climate change movement has to be anti-imperialist. Uh, and so we're glad that the U.S. military's environmental impacts uh, at least showed up in political discourse in the states. You know, Liz Warren had a had a thing about greening the military or whatever. Uh, but we, we, we just don't think that that's enough. And we don't think that that's actually maybe a meaningful thing to say. Solar panels uh, on tanks won't do it. No, man, it's uh, it'd be cool if it was, but actually it wouldn't. It doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, like whatever is left of the anti-war movement needs to coalesce around climate and the climate folks really need to start taking into account the role of U.S. interventionism all over the world and kind of the, you know, the sheer global scale of the U.S. war machine has to be dialed back radically. And it needs to happen for all sorts of reasons. And, you know, people on the left particularly need to do a better job of, of coming up with a coherent modern left foreign policy. And I think one part of that is coming to terms with the sprawling environmental damage that modern imperialism does. And so, you know, one of the ways that we put it is that you've just got to shudder vast 
uh, sections of the war machine. Mm. One of the interesting sources of your paper mentions how the logistic systems that the military builds for fuel efficiency is also a logistical delivery mechanism for capitalism itself. So not only are we encouraging countries all over the world to build sprawling physical infrastructures, which then contribute to environmental degradation, land use changes, greenhouse gas emissions, but we're literally reshaping political and economic structures uh, of countries all over the world. Yeah, which I, I think, you know, maybe we can see it more with its environmental consequences now, but I don't think that that's necessarily new. I think we can trace U.S. foreign policy to making the world safe for American capital you know, back to the early 19th century and uh, just the way that capital and environmental degradation are kind of inextricably linked, I think, is becoming more and more clear in folks' minds. And so when we add this third component, when we add when we have the U.S. military in, maybe we can kind of start to see a more clear idea about the role of U.S. empire in the world in terms of both environmental change and uh, you know economic causes and consequences. I'm I'm really looking forward to this concrete paper, by the way. <laughs> yeah, oh. man, that shit's wild. As is, uh, you know, and there's there's other kind of mundane things like how much water, you know, clean water around the world gets burned up uh in various u.s military activities you know what is the topsoil loss rate for all the garbage food that uh the military feeds the troops mm -hmm. uh you know all of our sundry interlocking uh environmental crises i think you could really kind of exemplify through the practices of u.s empire which is all about achieving the most impact at the lowest cost well, I've I've got a question actually. Again, I think this is sort of for myself, but you know, we all have these. Everybody has heard the memes or the like jokes about ah, uh, you know, there's oil there. In comes <laughs> the yeah. American army; they're going to invade uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever. Um, but now that we have had this uh, explosion in shale oil, and and this very safe domestic supply, it even though it's not for forever, I think a lot of people like to think it is. Uh, has that sort of need to maintain these supply chains to places that have oil sort of dissipated? Like we see right now this uh, escalation that's going on uh, around Iran, around the Gulf there, that is this, this choke point um, in, in the strait. And uh, I, I feel like 10 years ago, this never would have happened because it would have been too uh, too much of a threat to the global oil chain. But now that we have these these other domestic supplies, I feel like the U.S. military feels like they're free to escalate without fear to impacting their own operations. And do you see some sort of change to this? And also, if I'm speaking from like a strategic military guy perspective, is that maybe a sign that we should be transitioning to to more green militaries? I feel disgusting saying that, but like a green military operation so that you can be independent of uh, these these ridiculous logistic chains that you're currently a slave to. Yeah, I mean, like, I think I think the military would really like to have it both ways, right? I think that they would like to be able to have clean energy or renewable energy, and I don't think they really care about the cleanness at the end of the day. It's more about access to cheap fuel, whatever form it takes, in the least dangerous way possible, and in ways that frees up their their budgets to, you know, buy more of whatever it is that they buy, you know, different kinds of weapon systems or, you know, fancier drones. Um, but at the same time, one of their fundamental roles is to protect U.S. commercial interests around the world. And one of the U.S.'s biggest commercial interests around the world is the oil trade. And so they have to kind of be intimately bound up with oil in any number of ways. And so I think that's what gets us to what's going on in Iran and the Strait of Hormuz right now. And yeah, I think maybe that is a, a reasonable assessment to say that shale or the access to, to that much plentiful oil has maybe emboldened the U.S. to take actions that they wouldn't have otherwise. But at the same time, the invasion of Iraq was incredibly disruptive to, you know, global energy mm -hmm. logistics systems. And, uh, you know, they still came out of that OK, even if they didn't achieve any of the other objectives. <laughs> Uh, I got to stop and ask you here, you know, um, I mean, you're very deep in this logistics world and, and you see all this mess and, and you see climate change and what it's doing. You're doing all this research. Uh, you're doing all this work for it. And 
ultimately, like, what do you believe in? Man, that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, and it's not something that I s- spend a lot of time reflecting on. Um, and I guess I could give you the, the stock socialist or democratic socialist answer that I believe in people. And I believe that, you know, if we work together, we can really achieve amazing things and we can, uh, you know, we can resist U.S. imperialism. We can resist the you know, continuing hegemony of the global fossil fuel industry. And I, I really hope that's true. And I, I think that it is to a large extent. And a lot of the growth of Green New Deal discourse, both here and in the U.S., has really given me a lot of hope. And I, I do believe in the central tenets of the Green New Deal. And I think that we can have transformative policies. Um, but in the short run, uh, I believe that we have to kind of look at look after ourselves and not get bogged down in all of these existential threats uh, because it just becomes too much. And so, yes, we should be working towards a greener socialist future uh, that doesn't imperil, you know, y'all over there in the States, me over here in Britain, we're not going to be the first ones uh, or even the kind of in in the middle of the line to really feel the impacts of climate change and our sundry other interlocking environmental crises, right? Those are going to be borne by people in the global South who've contributed the least and will feel the worst impacts. And that hell of sucks. And so I think, you know, in the short term, we, I believe uh, that we need to be working to ameliorate those impacts while at the same time uh, rapidly reducing our contribution to environmental degradation that isn't going to blow back on us in the first instance. But also take care of yourself, because if you think about this stuff all the time, you will go crazy and you will burn out. <laughs> yeah, we know that too well. That, that's a pretty good answer. Um, is there anything else you want to add, things that we missed, things that you feel like people should know before we say goodbye? No, man, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, Patrick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure, y'all. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Well, well, good luck and uh, keep your chin up, eh? <laughs> I think we got pretty good at, at yeah. hanging in there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, hopefully we don't come up with any more reasons to get our chins down anytime soon. David, I don't have much to add to that interview. I think uh, Dr. Patrick Bigger really summed it up nicely for us and, and was really doing some valuable research, uh, some groundbreaking research on the greenhouse gas emissions of the U.S. military and the unforeseen consequences of that. But I do just really quickly want to read one more quote from his paper that we didn't talk about because something we, we discuss a lot on this show is the over-quantification of everything. We take a forest with all its diverse habitats, its innumerable species, and the vast interconnections of all those that make life possible, not just in that forest, but for habitats and ecosystems outside of it through the various ecosystem services. We take all of that and we reduce it to some quantifiable statistic or data on two by four lumber products. And then we convert those lumber products to a dollar value. And that's uh, really the only input that goes into the data on the health of our economy, right? So we leave so much out. And we've talked about logistics on this show and how logistics kind of aims to serve that purpose. It, it turns the whole world into these quantifiable figures that can then be moved around and with the goal of moving them around most efficiently. But I, I think they sum it up really well in this paper. And I just want to read this quote for you. Logistics is a calculative rationality insofar as it seems to abstract the movement of people, goods, and services from their operational context. It then subjects these movements to logics of precision and streamlining efficiency. And finally, it reorients the movements along predetermined diverse relations of production and distribution to delivery times, stock keeping units, and other values amenable to measurement and calculation, end quote. It's so interesting, David, that we've, we've done all these calculations and we've figured out how to move things around the world at breakneck speed, and we have this vast, sprawling military to support that. But uh, I guess missing from our calculations are the, the fundamental destruction to the fabric of life that, that goes along with that. I'm just imagining in my head this like logistic guy in the military. He's got like, he's got like a, eagle on his shoulder you know sitting there with all these spreadsheets and he's like 
I just can't balance the budget, sir. And this brigadier general or whatever walks over. He's like, what's the problem? We have the funding. He's like, it's not the funding that's the issue. It's the balance of the fabric of communities and life that won't fit in. <laughs> it just, it won't work out. We can't fight this war. Um, wouldn't it be cool if they did that though? Like they have this, like uh, these bylines in the spreadsheet. They're like environmental protection, a community in- enablement. Yeah. And then the brigadier general is like, damn it, son, we're going to figure this out. I didn't. I didn't join the military to destroy this world. I I joined it to bring it together. Yeah, maybe this is like our our climate apocalypse military. They're like fighting, like planning out strategic attacks to uh, like rebuild communities and stuff. I don't know. I I don't like couching the language of everything in war, and it seems obviously I'm in my language thing still, and we'll we'll do a thing on it at some point. But you know, everything these days is like ah, oh, it's a it's a war on whatever. It's a war on drugs. It's a war on the climate. Mm. It's a war on yeah. bugs. I don't know. Um, I get so tired of this. The bugs are certainly losing that war. Yeah, it's the constant war though. We're talking about endless war. We can't even escape it in our language, where there's not even any. Uh, environmental degradation or whatever happening, but maybe it's just our brains have gotten so rotted from this f- everything, endless war. Uh, it's just whew, I'm exhausted. I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, to pull back <laughs> to this larger conversation is, I, I mean, this shows so much, and I, I talked about this a little bit in the interview. It's just always about logistics, and this conversation is really no different. And and I mean, maybe to carry on with my joke a little bit here, we've become such masters of logistics, and especially the military, that it's enabled so much incredible growth, this endless growth that has gotten into this problem in the first place. And I guess endless growth, endless war, uh, the treadmill of destruction, you might call it. It doesn't have to, though. This expertise in logistics could enable us to do incredible things in the world, to help the world. I mean, so you've heard before this fact that we grow enough food in the world to be able to feed everybody no problemo, right? But the problem is, is we can't get the food to everywhere it needs to go for whatever reasons. And that reason is typically profitability. And if we were to refocus our logistical chains, this could be solved. We could grow less food and we could grow food in a more sustainable way and not have to destroy the soil, destroy everything with these monoculture crops in order to boost yields enough that, that we can make all this stuff profitable. If we ignored all these other things that we've quantified that are the wrong things to quantify, then we could enable these, this deep understanding of logistics, moving things around the world to build a better world. And, and that's exciting for me. All this information and knowledge that we've acquired in the process of destroying the world can also be used to liberate it and bring us into something better. And I mean, maybe we don't talk about mm-hmm. this enough on the show because we so much of our conversations about logistics are like, look at this new terrible thing that happened because we created shipping containers or whatever. Um, yeah. And that same knowledge, though, can be liberatory. And I mean, knowledge is always a double sided sword. It can do good. It can do evil. And we've, for some reason, really decided to focus on the evil. But it doesn't have to be that way. But David, don't you think part of the reason why so much of our tools get used for evil is because maybe we as a broader public have been conditioned to just assume that technology is itself inherently good or that the market forces will themselves just direct things towards the good purposes. But we're not really making any decisions about what our goals and values as a society really are, right? It seems like this free market principle of we'll just let the economy figure everything out. If you just incentivize people to make money, well, everyone will just naturally do what's best for themselves. And that will collectively help society move forward and progress. We've kind of abandoned societal goals. We don't come together and say, well, we have this technology. We have the ability to uh, datafy so much and we can apply uh, artificial intelligence to sort it all. What should we do with that? Or we have the ability to organize the world in terms of logistics. What should we do with that technology? How should we organize ourselves to benefit our communities the best? Instead, we just leave it up to the tech CEOs who, for some reason, we've put our faith in. And maybe it's time to really focus in on our goals and values. And I think Patrick said it best when he said, look, if you want to solve this problem, you have to look at foreign policy. You have to look at the reason the United States military is waging war in the first place. You're not going to solve it by greening the military. You're not going to solve it by replacing one fuel source for another, which is only going to enable the military to continue doing its operations. You need to look at why it's doing those operations and decide if that's a good purpose. Yeah. I mean, I think you're really onto something there. And and 
I was halfway through about to interrupt you and be like, haha, Daniel, you've played into my trap card, but <laughs> you kept going and redeemed yourself. But uh, I mean, yeah, you are right. Vast amounts of the economy, of, of of the way that we've organized our society are centered around these things that like, oh, the market will sort it out. And this assumption, I guess, that let's let humans live their most human nature-y way. I mean, you, I'm, you can't see y'all, but I'm making air quotes. Human nature. And with the assumption that human nature is greed and competition. And that if we just use that natural drive, more air quotes right there, for greed and competition, then it's going to naturally push the market along and we're going to get the most efficient, whatever, use of resources and a bunch of inventions. People are going to be creating stuff because they want to acquire more, but whatever. Who cares? Push, push it all the side. And I mean, that's what's gotten us into this mess right now. That's what's destroyed the earth and stuff. And so, I mean, even if you are one of these greed, human nature people, why would you want to organize society in a way that enables some of the worst qualities of people to run unchecked? And why would you want to organize society in a way that rewards that? If you believe that greed is a innate human nature, shouldn't you organize society in a way that naturally tries to discourage and fight that? That seems to make a lot more sense to me because this is a naturally destructive thing. And it should be no no surprise that when we've organized society about enabling this, that this destructive tendency of an individual it magnifies itself and destroys not only society, destroys not only ultimately civilization, but also the earth and all life on it as well. I mean, that's, that's the path we're heading down to because for some reason we decide, well, let's enable this for our own profit. Fuck that. Done. It's stupid. If we're going to organize society, you know, we should step back and be like, well, let's fight these natural tendencies if we really think they're human nature. And I, I, all my liberal use of air quotes should suggest that I don't think that. I think people are naturally cooperative. I think people naturally want to share and help each other and that we're taught not to do that and then thrown into a society that that really uh, rewards backstabbing each other. And that's why, you know, CEOs are psychopaths in much higher rates than the general population and whatever. So to get back into this, we really should be taking like a very large look at ourselves as a society and saying, is this the way we want to organize things? Are we quantifying the right stuff? And the answer, of course, is no. And and has this process of quantifying the wrong stuff, of turning it into big data, of chewing through that data and trying to optimize and make it more efficient and more profitable, been what's led us down to this path of destruction that we've seen? And the military and its pioneering use of logistics, because war is logistics, and it has been for thousands of years, and those logistics that are refined in war trickle down and are what enable the explosive growth of society and, and culture and civilization has for, once again, thousands of years. Go back to our earlier conversations about uh, the creation of money, the creation of debt. A lot of that was pushed by the needs of warfare. So the, the very fundamental ways that we've organized ourselves for thousands and thousands of years have been centered around the needs of logistics, of war, of feeding people, of paying soldiers. And it all comes down to that. And and so society, human culture, it's all tied together inextricably with the logistics of war. And here we are once more finding ourselves in this feedback loop of increasing deaths around the world, of increasing conflict that the military is finding itself involved with because in large part due to climate change. And then at the same time, they're contributing to climate change, making things worse. And we're just on this path of destruction. And we need at some point to interrupt it. And if we we don't have a dramatic step in, a dramatic shift where we say, fuck this, stop, then we're going to keep going down this path. This is not something that can be fixed with like incremental changes. We can't like switch, as you as you said, Daniel, to solar powered tanks, though I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working out the uh, the energy needed for that. I, I, I don't think those will quite work, but um, I like I like the image. It's very solar solar punk. It's cool. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that's not going to do it. Elizabeth Warren is greening of the military is not going to do it. This has to be total full stop stop of this imperialism stop of of the focus of our society on this this area and and looking at ourselves individually looking at ourselves uh, as a society and saying maybe we do want something better and that we believe that that's possible. Let's turn the everywhere war into the nowhere war. No war. Nowhere war? The no... Nowhere war? The, the, the nowhere war. Nowhere war. Nowhere, no time. Nowhere, Never no time. how. Not on my watch. Not on, not on this Brigadier General's shift. We'll all be Brigadier Generals in the nowhere war. That's a war I look forward to serving beside you, David. 
Well, uh, uh, (laughs) you're going to have to spend a lot of time figuring out that last little bit that we said there. But this whole episode is worth thinking about, and we hope you will. You can find this paper. You can find a bunch of other papers that we read and, uh, for the most part, didn't really include in this episode, but are interesting and worth reading nonetheless, as well as a full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, or supporting us on patreon.com slash ashesashescast. We really do appreciate your support. Um, It encourages us. It helps us keep going. Uh, We're also sending stickers to many of our Patreon supporters, so get on that. We'd also like to thank our associate producers, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. Thanks so much for your help. And of course, if you want to get in touch with us, send us an email. It's contact at ashesashes.org. We read all of your uh, submissions, your feedback, your thoughts, and we really do appreciate it. And if you don't like email, but do love talking on the phone, well, lucky for you, we've got a phone number. And we're going to put all these phone voicemails into a giant call-in show when we get enough of them. So definitely call in, leave us your thoughts, leave us an interesting comment or a story. We'll we'll make something fun out of it. If you want to be a part of that, you can at this number. It's 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. We've also got a whole bunch of social media accounts. They're lots of fun. You can find them at Ashes Ashes Cast on whatever your favorite social media network is. And we've got a great chat community and an application called Discord. You can find a link to that on our website. Just click Community Discord and you'll find us there. Daniel and I hang out there all the time and we love uh, talking to everybody. And uh, we learn a lot there. I, I, I know I learn a lot. I don't know about you, Daniel, but it's a great group of people. and We'd love to have all of you there. Everyone there is 10 times smarter than I am. So Yeah, shout out to all of you. I definitely, yeah. I learn everything that doesn't go over my head. But luckily, Daniel's pretty tall. <laughs> so. All right, let's close this out. Okay. Uh, we've got another conversation episode next week as we ramp up for another deep dive the following week. And uh, we hope you'll tune in for that. But if, if that's not your cup of tea, don't worry. We'll be back with another one of these research-based episodes in two weeks. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye-bye.